Welcome back, everyone. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle. I'm joined by my co-host Stu Miniwin from Wikibon.org. And uh, we are here with Ranga, Rangachari, who's the Vice President General Manager of Storage, Big Data for Red Hat. Uh, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks, John. Thanks. That's a lot, uh, a lot of action going on. You know, storage, big data. I mean, that's where the, all the action's at. And you know, we love covering storage. We, we look at storage. And storage is always the conversation that always comes down to. Because at the end of the day, you got to store the data. Yeah. And it's got to fit into the operating system. So it is a subsystem of the operating system. But now in context of the cloud, it's a huge conversation. Absolutely. And I want to get your thoughts on, on the kinds of things that you're seeing at the show, what you guys are talking about, and how does the storage fit into the software-defined data Data center into the cloud on the public, private, with virtualization and the physical world, because that's a key component. It's a huge subsystem and everyone is re-architecting their, their, their operating this environments. Is, no, absolutely, there's a lot of things that we can cover, but first off, thank you, thank you for having me here. My only uh, suggestion would have been, have this outdoors, it's a beautiful day out there. <laughs> it would have been great to bask in the 60 degrees temperature, but it's beautiful. Uh, but. Um, uh, you had a lot of questions, but the, the first and foremost, I think um, what and I've been, this is my fourth summit, and uh, what I'm really impressed and what gets, gets me excited is the continued innovation. You know, when I talk to customers, talk to partners, uh, every year you go back and there's a new thing on the horizon, there's new leading indicators of how people are trying to take advantage of some of the technology advances to solve their business problems. Um, getting into storage, you know, I think uh, what we saw was a pronounced shift uh, over the last three or four years. And I would argue that uh, it was because of a couple of reasons, right? One is just the movement to cloud. Because if you really think about it, what cloud does, especially around public clouds, you cannot take a piece of storage hardware and move it into a public cloud, right? It, it defies the laws of physics. So that in a way really necessitated the need for a software-defined approach to storage. The other um, aspect is just a new type of workloads. And uh, unstructured data, industry analysts expect that over the next five years, 90% of enterprise data is going to be unstructured in nature. So unstructured data requires a different type of treatment. It's not no more scale up, it's scale out. So you got to continue to deal with the volume and the velocity of the data that's coming in. So those are the two trends that we see are really kind of bringing this to the forefront. So a lot of folks have been dealing with data, with business intelligence, data warehouse, and kind of the older paradigm, you know, park it out there, I got a fence around, I go out and send some queries, but now as data becomes central to the value proposition for application, it's part of the development, but it's also part of the OS. So I want to get your definition. What is, in your, in your view, software-defined storage? Very simply, and I think, um, uh, the way I define, or the way, not me, but even the customers think about software-defined storage is on two fronts. One is the ability to truly decouple the services that your software layer can provide, independent of the underlying hardware. <clears throat> right, so the intelligence elevates to the software level, and the ultimate goal is you should be able to take industry standard commodity x86 servers, which has got a tremendous amount of horsepower built into it, and layer in your software solution on top, and just have all the services that you've been providing to your constituent end user. So this is data replication, whether data backup, or data migration. So the entire gamut of services that you're used to, the only difference is to the customer, it gives them complete flexibility and freedom of choice. I could go with an HP server today, I could go with an IBM server tomorrow, I could go with a Dell server the day after, and nothing changes as far as the storage services that I provide. So really able to separate out the hardware and the software. And, you know, and the interesting part is it's just not, you can look at it in isolation and storage, but I think the perfect uh, chemistry is with cloud, uh, computers becoming software defined. Networking, you've heard about software defined networking. So the triple play here is software defined storage, software defined compute, and software defined networking. Yeah, so, so Ranga, actually, Wikibon did some research earlier this year. We created a, a market definition of what we called a server SAM. Uh -huh. Really a scale-out architecture that allows both compute and storage to be able to scale. Uh, in, in general, if, it, if it's done right, it should be open, it should be yes. highly scalable. Um, and you know, we felt Gluster actually fit under, for, as, as a service uh, that could be part of this type of architecture. Absolutely. It fit into our definition. So, um, can you tell us, you know, Red Hat bought you know, Gluster yes. in 2011. 
2011. Yes. Um, it really, you know, obviously Red Hat had a long history working with the uh, storage uh, ecosystem, but yeah. it, it did change a little bit how, uh, you know, Red Hat looks at the storage yes. market. So can, can you lay out for us kind of Red Hat's vision of uh, kind of the storage portfolio? That, that Absolutely, that absolutely. And yeah, you know, we've had, um, I'd say, you know, file systems since day one. And I think um, the, if you go back to late 2011 when we acquired Gluster, uh, what we saw was a pronounced shift in the customers' uh, buying patterns and customers' uh, you know, definition of how they want their infrastructure to be set up. And the two key things was we saw just the uh, cloud. And when I say cloud, I'm using the term pretty loosely, which is you know, private cloud, public cloud, open hybrid cloud, and the unstructured data. So those were the two key drivers where we said, look, the old ways of doing it aren't going to cut it. So that was the, think of it as the starting point for us to uh, take, you know, go after this market opportunity that's out there to take advantage of. Now, uh, the other piece, which um, we don't talk about much, uh, for the right reasons we understated, is what really attracted us to the Gluster uh, solution. Obviously the technology was great, but more importantly the community. I mean, the, for a company, when we acquired them, was two, two and a half years into uh, existence, but the community was so vibrant, and um, we felt that you know, we could, under the auspices of Red Hat, under the stewardship of Red Hat, we could really move the community forward, and we've done that. We've done a phenomenal job, I think, of continuing to foster some of the innovation that's going on, not just in software-defined storage, in open software-defined storage. Yeah, so, so you mentioned you know, the aspect of how Gluster fits into cloud deployments. My yeah. understanding this can be kind of private or public and service providers. Yeah. I haven't heard much talk about kind of the service provider and you know, public cloud yeah. from you know, Red Hat providing the infrastructure for them. Obviously customers put deployments of you know, Red Hat everywhere, yes. but can you speak to sure. you know, service sure. providers and the like? So I mean, the service provider market is, it's from a service provider standpoint, right, you've got the classic uh, service providers who provide storage as a service to their customers. But you also have some of these large organizations or internal service providers, right? And so there's some people who provide storage as a service, as a basic service. The other for service providers basically take storage as an integral component of the service that they provide to their customer. An example of that is uh, Pandora Radio. Pandora Internet Radio, even before the acquisition of Gluster, was using Gluster as a way to archive the media and everything else. So they were actually providing storage in a way as a service to their customers. Um, just, you know, the other example I can think of, which is a different type of storage as a service, which is Intuit. Uh, I mean, today, as you all know, in North America, yesterday was the tax deadline. And so Intuit uses Red Hat storage as the foundational storage platform for their web properties. So when you go in and click on the submit button, that gets stored within Red Hat storage. Frank, I want to ask about the customer uh, traction in context to Red Hat and where Red Hat's going. So at Red Hat, obviously, there's no doubt, I mean, we talk to customers all the time, and they've had Red Hat Enterprise uh, Linux for years and years, powering their business, all the greatness of Red Hat. Um, but they've dealt with storage. You got EMC drives, and yep. you got NetApp, and they have a lot of legacy infrastructure that, quite frankly, is working pretty damn well, yep. and they, they're okay with it. But they realize you got to go to the cloud. So yep. I got to ask you, how do you see the storage component that you are architecting and solutions you're rolling out fit into the vision where Red Hat's going in the cloud, specifically around OpenStack, OpenShift, that's the hot area. We got the, we saw RHEL 7, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 released yesterday. Um, we got availability with the private cloud with Dell announced today. This major traction in OpenStack, all the enterprises see OpenStack as the bridge to the cloud, yep. not as a mutually exclusive environment but one that's going to coexist. So yeah. how do you look at that? You got legacy, I got to deal with physical hardware, okay, software's the key, but how are you guys building that, that solution? Can so there are um, you know, three um, aspects of it, right? One is, even if I were to pop it a level higher, every one of our products today, you know, whether it's storage or OpenStack or OpenShift, the central theme behind that is open hybrid cloud help customers on a journey of not just a hybrid cloud, but an open hybrid cloud. The ability for them to say, look, I'm going to use this public cloud today, but tomorrow, for whatever reason, I'm going to move to a different public cloud. How do you really create these multiple bridges? So having said that, if you think about storage, is an integral part of it because data needs to move you know, back and forth regardless of where it resides. So storage is a very 
I'd say more than a critical, it's an integral part of our open hybrid cloud strategy. A proof point of that is today, if you look at Red Hat storage, you can run it in a physical environment to your point, you can run it in a virtual environment, you can run it in an open stack environment, or you can run it in a public cloud environment. And the fact is because the way Gluster, which is Red Hat storage is based on, is designed to be POSIX compatible, you don't have to do any application rewrites. So I create an application on-prem, I just move the application. Let's, let's pause that for a second. Yeah. That's a really important point because that's that's a requirement that Absolutely. people have. They have. If you're in an enterprise, positive compliance, compliance is a huge deal. Absolutely. That's not a, like a throwaway feature. Yeah. So if I'm a new vendor, if I don't have positive compliance, you're pretty much specced out, right? You are. I, you know, and it's, it's it's also the fact that it's you know what it does for them is it takes a tremendous amount of the friction in creating rewriting the app to make it purpose built for cloud A, cloud B, cloud C. So we've taken all the friction out of the system, uh, good point. The other, um, I think to your point, was around OpenStack. Uh, today's um, Dell announcement, as well as yesterday, I think we talked about a few more customers uh, publicly talking about yep. uh, OpenStack. So one of the customers, and we got a lot more, but one of the customers was the university in Portugal. In a great use case where they're actually using Red Hat Enterprise Linux like OpenStack and Red Hat Storage in conjunction. Because in an ideal world, you need both hands to clap, right? You can't just go in and say, here's my virtual compute, what do I do for storage? So having them work together. We might have to do a site visit to Portugal, we'll have a cute, <laughs> that would be you know, a good opportunity. Um, now this is interesting, because what we're seeing is two threads, right? Customer migration to the cloud, so I have an enterprise that has pre-existing uh, infrastructure and software, but, and the application. So yesterday we heard the big theme was application delivery, we heard Docker and containers, and containers to cloud is what virtualization is to, to the OS, if you want to look at kind of a parallel. That's what we talked about that yesterday. So I, have, I want to ask you how you, you guys talk about this internally at Red Hat and within the open source community. Linux kernel has always been the discussion. So I'm a developer back in the old days when I was an old, old developer. Memory was a real scarce resource and disk was the viable you know, swap out because it was abundant. Now you with Flash and Persistent, you have a paradigm shift going on. So there's been discussion in the industry around Linux kernel, software practices where we can take advantage of not just RAM, but SSD, solid state. Yes. So how is that changing the storage equation? Could you elaborate on what you guys are talking about internally and how you guys look at that trend sure. and how it so, affects the developer? So the, the, from a technical standpoint, a uh, thing that um, we, it's worth kind of repeating here is the Red Hat storage technology, it runs at a user space. Yeah. So what that means is there's no kernel implications, right? So we take advantage of any new kernel functionality that's out there without having to go modify the kernel to suit a purpose. So architecturally, having it run as a user level application, you know, frees a lot of uh, innovation. Or, you know, innovation really makes it possible. So you're not you know, creating a dependency. You know, exactly, that's a great way to put it, absolutely. So the developer is looking at the kernel development, they could pivot off whatever innovations happen there. Absolutely, and you know, the, and there's a lot of proof points here that we can talk about, but in, in respect to the uh, SSD piece, one of the things that we keep very close eye on is not just innovation around flash and SSDs, but also if you look at it today, I mean the other day I was reading that um, uh, Seagate has come up with uh, five terabyte drives in production. So if you think about it, you can get, just pick a model, HP server with 60 drives, concatenate eight of them together. You now have a 1.2 petabyte storage farm at, I'd say, you know, tenth of the cost of what people are used to today. I mean, that's the beauty of parallelizing your software innovation along with the innovation that's going on in the hardware side. So, so, so Ranga, since we've got the discussion of storage going on, yeah. I'm wondering if you have commentary on what the folks over at VMware have done with vSAN. Really kind of, you know, churned up a bunch of discussion as to storage architectures and, and the role of really, you know, virtualization. Yeah. Um, so, you know, w w what's your take on what's happening with vSAN? Well, so, the, you know, without getting into the specific merits or the demerits of the, um, uh, any specific solution, um, our approach is very much different in that what we, it's truly open, right? So we don't force you to run you know, one type of hypervisor to take advantage of the storage functionality. Uh, you know, if you know on our uh, operating system side of things, you know, people run RHEL on top of VMware, you know, we don't care, people run RHEL on top of uh, Hyper-V, so give the customers the choice as opposed to saying, you know, that, that's one of the problems today I see with the uh, enterprise storage space today, it's proprietary, not just a proprietary, it's just a bunch of silos, right? I got a silo for 
application A, you know, that's SAN based. I got silo B for NAS based. And forget the app, uh, CapEx, the cost of operating those environments with different tools, with different skill sets, it's just driving these guys nuts. And that's what our customers tell us. They say, don't force me into another silo. Right, and you know, if we use the tagline, liberate your information, and that resonates with a lot of people because now they can go in and say, okay, the shackles have been removed, I can do what I want. So the data center has been a big battleground and there's been a lot of marketing around the software-defined data center, which really drove out of, as you mentioned earlier, software-defined networking. And yeah. Nasira was the, the shot heard around the world when uh, they sold for a billion dollars on $50 million VC investment <laughs> from VMware. Everyone kind of took, you saw Cisco kind of reshuffle some things, and so, you know, that is really the beginning of what, I, what started moving down to the emphasis of software, and you mentioned that earlier. So, so when you look at that trajectory, where do you guys see the evolution of the data center in context of storage and in context of big data because you have to oversee the big data component. So if I'm putting data in the cloud, yep. I have data on this. The data warehousing business intelligence market is under, under siege and being disrupted with new economics. Yep. Versus, uh, visualization and in data insights are the top customer driven yep. uh, things I, that they want. Yep. You know? So how do you make that low latency data modeling really become core to the software? So, uh, I mean, I can give you uh, the Red Hat perspective and also the customer's perspective. Um, you know, I think when customers look at some of the leading um, properties like a Google or a Facebook, um, they know they can do it. In fact, I was, had lunch with one of our customers yesterday and he said the mandate or the edict from uh, the top is what he defined as a commodity data center. Right which is stop going with these specialized things, I just want everything, standard parts, much like what the classic uh, web-facing properties are doing today, and then hardware is going to fail, it's got to be replaced, just move on, right? So the intelligence is moving into the software space. Now, with aspect to virtualization and data virtualization specifically, uh, we have a very rich uh, product portfolio, I don't know, JBoss product line. One of them is our JBoss data virtualization product. At the core, what it does is it allows you to get data from SQL databases, from NoSQL databases, regardless of what the myriad of sources are, and have them come to one single resting point. So then, if that's stored on Red Hat storage, you can run your analytics on top of that. And you can take advantage of all the you know, hardware advances with flash or SSDs or everything else, you can get away from and even within the big data space, right, you're seeing some of the new emerging trends around things like Spark and other things that are really starting to... Yeah, it's interesting, you've seen the original Linux Red Hat model of decoupling software from the servers now going at such a large scale. Yeah. yeah Padma Wari was saying yesterday that data virtualization, in, in her opinion, is the next big thing because then you start looking at the data side of the equation where data becomes a core aspect of, yeah. of what's going on in the OS. Um, do you agree with that and, 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 and share with the folks that aren't in the trenches, who don't yeah. know all the nuances of data virtualization, why is that such a big trend? Why is she saying that? Why are you feeling the same way? So, if you take the virtualization uh, word out of it, right, so the way customers think about it is storage, data, information. I mean, that's kind of the logical, I need a place to put this, which is my storage infrastructure. They need all this data out there. Um, and if you go back to the model from 20 years ago, everything was physical. So I had a big, huge server box with some storage in it. I had you know, a whole bunch of ETL tools and all that stuff that were pumping in data. Now, with virtualization, the added advantage of virtualization cutting across those three veins is the fact that now you can really pack a lot of horsepower into a single physical chassis or a single physical cloud. And it's basically, I think, it's an economy of scale game, and moreover, economies of skill game. Right, you don't have people going across multiple places trying to do. So if you think about it, and I don't know whether that's the way they, this is really top of my head right now, but data storage virtualization, data virtualization, who knows, the next step would be information virtualization. Yeah, and also, the, right. it solves a privacy issue. You know, everyone talks about Gmail, Google, they store all your emails because it's just cheaper to store it forever <laughs> than just to <laughs> worry about de deleting it. But at some point, you got to blow away the data and might have some privacy issues. Stu, you want to comment on that? Um, actually, I, I wanted to get a little more from, from the big data aspect of things, sure. you know, before we wrap up. So, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, you know, when we think about, you know, Red Hat and big data, um, you know, 
other than being kind of the operating system for it, you know, what should we think of when we think of you know Red Hat and so the big data space? So big data is more than Hadoop. I mean, one of the common uh, misconceptions is you know big data is Hadoop. I think big data is more than Hadoop. So if you go look at every, let me give you a couple of examples. Right, one is obviously Red Hat Enterprise Linux today is a huge um, operating system where all these big data workloads are run. Now, if you elevate it to the cloud side of things, for instance, one of the things we did with um, Hadoop in this case was around Ambari, where we actually worked with the community on the Ambari project to make it more versatile to support other file systems besides HEFS. We're doing something similar in the OpenStack with a project called Sahara, which used to be called Savannah which is an orchestration of OpenStack. So up and down the stack, compute, storage, network, application as a servant. Uh, yesterday, Hortonworks announced something with an OpenShift product line, with the ability to, you can now scale your Hortonworks environment running on top of OpenStack. So you'll see us participating in every part of the ecosystem or the stack up there. So on the big data front, what do you think about the whole validation with the Cloudera Intel news? Because that really got everyone's attention. So in the sphere of the Hadoop world, yeah. that's a massive event. But you know, it's a small blip on the radar when you look at the entire computer industry, which you guys have a purview into with Red Hat and, and, and Linux. Um, you're seeing Hadoop becoming a really relevant piece of that now. So, so obviously Intel is working closely with uh, Cloudera on that investment, but yet Hortonworks, and we had Intel on yesterday saying, hey, we still love Hortonworks, we're Intel, just because we make one move doesn't mean, uh, yeah. we, you know, we understand ecosystems, and, and specifically upstream, Hortonworks is plugged in. And Hortonworks, some say, have said, and we've said, is the Red Hat uh, of Hadoop, same business model, doing very, very well. So Hadoop is now elevated, but that's not the only data open source thing. So as this becomes much more mainstream, um, how are you guys developing that part of the ecosystem? Can you elaborate what's going on with Horton? Where's you doing joint engineering? Yeah. Is it just more partnership at this point? Um, what's going on there? No, so specific to Hortonworks, we announced um, two months ago, I think mid-February, mid where it's more than just a you know, Barney relationship, if you will. There's a lot of engineering um, engagements going on between the two companies. But the, but the broader point is, you know, we the, the cool thing with big data, and I'm using the big word big data pretty loosely, is beyond Hadoop, the center of innovation around all these new big data projects are all open source. And you know that's actually a great platform for Red Hat, for open source and for Red Hat, where we absolutely want to have a platform where ISVs can really thrive. And regardless of whether it's Hadoop or whether it's, you know, um, There's a huge ecosystem on analytics right now. You're seeing a lot of companies kind of finding a lot of white space in yeah. the analytics space, which they're not trying to be a platform part of it. Yeah. So that's really a good signal from the that's ecosystem fair. standpoint. So I got to ask you, as the platform as a service battleground continues to be a top, top of mind with OpenStack and OpenShift relative to other approaches, the data layer becomes a conversation sure. now. So yes. I'd like to get your perspective. How do you see the, the storage data layer in OpenStack developing? Um, because that's a real key part of the stack in this middleware environment. Yeah, so in OpenStack or OpenShift? I'm sorry. OpenStack yeah. first and then maybe OpenShift. So, you know, the, uh, I'd say the um, basic foundational stuff exists today from a technology standpoint where you want to provide file services, object services, and block services. But there's a lot more things. In fact, you know, Red Hat and a few others, we're working on a project called Manila. Project Manila, which is file as a service for OpenStack. So that's going to happen. Uh, on the open OpenShift side of things, we are looking at do we containerize Red Hat storage, uh, things like that. So there's a lot of things that are going on, not just within the four walls of Red Hat, but out in the upstream community. Rock, the general manager of Red Hat, great to have you on theCUBE. I got to ask you one last question. Yeah. Um, what are you looking at around the corner? Right now, it's, it's pretty clear you guys are on the straight and narrow. Let's get software defined storage out there. You got a big data component, work, the, the work's pretty obvious. As you slow down to take that next corner, yeah. what's, 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 what are you watching that's around the corner that we should be mindful of as an industry and within the Red Hat ecosystem around the role of storage? Is it the data layer? Is it the, the continuing Linux kernel kind of issue we talked about? Is there other things that we should be mindful of? No, you know, I think um, we look at it, I think around the corner it looks um, you know, very nice, at least you know, when we peek around there it looks really good because <laughs> there are two aspects, right? One is more than, and I think uh, you brought the question up earlier, which is more than the enterprises, I think there is a tremendous opportunity for service providers, right? Who want to start offering storage as a service to their customers, and I think that, that part of the battleground, I think it's still not uh, there yet. So that's one of the things we are paying very close attention to. 
Hey, we are here inside theCUBE live in San Francisco for the Red Hat Summit celebrating our 10th year of this event. The ecosystem is changing and growing, evolving. Uh, as we said yesterday, the mojo continues for Red Hat. Uh, and again, open source is now tier one, uh, viable, mainstream, and it's taking a whole nother level power in this big innovation cycle we're living in the technology world. This is theCUBE, we'll be right back with our next guest.